I'm not trying to jump into like podcast mode here, but I feel like every time I've seen you, like even before we did the podcast, the first time before that, like at the very start, kind of when we first met, I felt like you were talking about how you'd been creatively like blocked for a long time or it was harder for you to just like write and write and write and write. And then every Mm -hmm. time since then, it seems like it's just been flowing, which is great. It's been great for me. (laughs) 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 It was really bad for a while. It really was. But I I think for the past, since maybe 2018, I've been good. Do you know, I know we've kind of talked about this before, but I also kind of forget what we've talked about. Do you know why that was? Like why it was hard before? I think it was the album Death and Magic. I think that process was so depressing for me (laughs) because I felt A&R'd so heavily. Right. That like it literally killed my drive to make anything that anyone wanted me to make. So if someone liked it, I didn't want to do it. <laughs> right, right. I know you that get... sounds so stupid, but like the fan base at the time, rhythm had been happening and like kids were being really purist about it. Right. And like it was new and they didn't want anything that was like that had ever been established. And so like nobody liked anything. They were begging for rhythm. I was like, I don't want to do that. I don't, it's not where I was from. And I was like, Blah, 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 blah. And then I was working on the album and everybody was like, well, it needs to be like this because Skrillex had just put out Recess. Everyone had their idea of what was going to happen next. Like everybody right. had their like take on it. And my take was that I wanted everyone to leave me the fuck alone. <laughs> it's funny. This, when, it's funny when you like get suspicious when people like your stuff too. Yes. I was not having a good time <laughs> for several years. No, it's and then in 2018... I just sat down and didn't tell anybody anything and just made a bunch of stuff. And it was all hard styly. Yeah. And everybody was like, this is cool and futuristic. And I was like, I fucking know. <laughs> and then <laughs> I put it out and it worked and I've been fine ever since. And now I'm happy. So <laughs> yeah, no, which is great. And that's the way it should be, man. That's I, I've been doing some of that. I, I'm not going to like go into too much detail yet on, on the podcast, but the, the just, making a bunch of shit and not telling a single soul about it. Mm -hmm. It's the best thing ever, man. It's like, yeah, I I, people need to realize just like, yeah, you you don't have to show everything to everybody all the time. You don't have to talk about it. Yeah. You really don't have to talk about it. You really shouldn't. (laughs) (laughs) You should just make stuff. I don't know. I, um, my team, it's so funny. Like the, the stuff that I've been up to is like, I don't know. It's like, I'm, I'm in the mode of big departures right now. And Wait, just like having mean? fun. I don't know. You you were at the DC show. Like there's a lot of change happening like with the project. Yeah. But yeah, it's yeah. like, it's all simultaneous. Like it's not like a movement away from, it's more like an inclusion in. Yeah, so there's just like, like a lot of things happening. But some of the stuff that I'm doing is less of like, uh, I'm sure you relate. Like, oh, can I do this? I'd like to see what my take on this is. And more just like, this is, I am doing this. Right. Like, <laughs> like I am in this genre now. Yeah, totally. And and maybe it's like, maybe this doesn't fit in with any of the current genre tropes and that's also fine. You that's know? fine. Yeah. I, I feel like luckily um, the current landscape over the past year has been very like broad. I think that's true. Yeah, I think that's true. I think, I, I don't know. Do you feel like crowds are more open to different stuff than they used to be? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't had anything thrown at me this year. <laughs> Wait, what did you have thrown at you before? Bottles, Jesus. candy, <laughs> glow sticks. I've had lots of stuff thrown at me. Yeah. I've been a dude, I've been I've been the subject of public ire for a very long time. And it doesn't feel like I am anymore. The only thing people don't like about me now is that I'm like basically into like destroying the government and <laughs> eating rich people's brains which is like who's who's gonna get mad about that in the rave scene Uh, obviously lots of people but lots of lots of men yeah yeah it's always men of course yeah (laughs) lots of men (laughs) but it just it does show you how far the scene has come when that's even an issue right (laughs) yeah i honestly like Yeah. Music, the music hasn't really upset that many people lately. Yeah. (laughs) I I think that's a definite change over like the course of my career. Well, because you upset people on Twitter. Does that, (laughs) but I mean, does that ever actually bleed into IRL? 
No. Yeah, there's no way, right? It never has. I couldn't imagine. <laughs> no, those those kids can't afford to go to shows. <laughs> Man, I, so I, I just talked to uh, I talked to Brad to to Sogi yesterday, and he was I love that guy. He's the best man, best dude. And uh, yeah, he was saying you guys just did the the back to back set at uh, Nocturnal. Was that the fest? Yeah, last it was a Nocturnal. Yeah. How how was that, man? Have you guys it was played super together fun. before? Well, he t- he was support on a lot of dates for me in the past we did a whole tour together like the hyper future tour and um he and i are really good friends we'd never back to back before and so we didn't have a plan at all i flew into los angeles on friday last week to just like set it up and like look at what we were gonna do and it ended up being that like he was really keen on playing a bunch of drum and bass and I was really keen on playing a bunch of like hardcore right. and a bunch of drum and bass. So we just kind of made a big old section where it kind of went in between the two. And we ended up playing like a solid like 10 or 15 of drum and bass. Nice. Which is hard to do at an American festival. Oh, yeah. Like, but we we found that it was like probably the most fun part of the night. I don't know. I had a lot of fun with them. How'd it go with the crowd? Did they, did it connect? Really good. Nice. Yeah, it connected. I was surprised. Um, I don't know. Playing with him is like really seamless because we're both very similar producers and very similar... DJs. Yeah. Yeah. You're both great DJs. And he's another one too, where I think kind of what we were just talking about before, like, I think at a certain point, I haven't asked him this directly, but I think he'd agree where it's like, he, I I was talking to him about how both he and I are like self-critical people in a lot of ways. And, but I do feel like he's gotten to a point creatively where he's just like, nah, fuck it. Like I'm going to make everything and I'm not going to worry too much about it. He's there. Yeah. Yeah, he he doesn't have. It it feels like um, he doesn't really have any constraints on what Tsuki is. Exactly. Yeah, and and I think he's also not too concerned with like like the the clout behind the name. There's better ways to say that, but I think I think he's not so worried about like Tsuki must be the biggest name in all of dance music. You know, it's like talking to him recently and just hearing the music it's like it just seems so free it's nice yeah man. i think i think it's because he's he's a wise man and i don't think all of his eggs are in one basket yeah i think music for him is more of like a it's an all-day everyday thing and that it serves different goals because i know i, I know he's into like i he's a songwriter he's a producer like i think he realizes that tisoki isn't the end-all be-all use for that talent right so he's got a lot of like options. And oh, yeah. I actually really envy him for that. Dude. I wish I had done that sooner. Dude, I mean, yeah, he like, I know he does real well off of sample packs too. Mm-hmm. All that kind of stuff. I mean, he it doesn't hurt me. that he's, yeah. su- it doesn't hurt that he's like supremely talented. Oh my God. One of the best, one of the absolute yeah. best. Like mm-hmm. I, I was, I can't remember who I was talking to. I was talking about Tosoki with somebody else a while back. And I was like, I, I don't know who's better than him. You know, like, there's there's plenty of people where you could be like, this is one of the best, but he's one of those where I'm like, I can't really name someone better than him just all around. Mm-mm. I think like, I think it's the kind of a toss up. I think in terms of like pushing, pushing boundaries within like um, ideas and mix, it's space laces. Yeah. And not just in dubstep, just in general, like textural sonic palette. Yeah. I think Space Laces understands sound and space better than anyone I've ever seen before. But I think Tosoki is probably the best pop songwriter working in dance music and such a good producer that he has outdone a lot of the people that inspired him in the first place. Dude, that's kind of where I'm at with it, where you can sometimes you can hear the influences, uh, mm-hmm. you know, not in like a corny way, but you can just you know, he's somebody who I think respects like the music he came up on. And it, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Sometimes I'm just like, oh, this is the version of this genre or this sound or this artist that actually can go off in 2022. You know exactly. I mean? He's He's been able to carry the torch and like the torch has just over time decided that it belongs to him. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude. That's, how, that's how I feel about him. It was really yeah. fun to play with him, man. And I, and I hadn't gotten to see him in a while, but we text like every now and again. Can you talk a little bit? Because I bet this is something people don't know about the process. There's so many like back to back sets at festivals, right? Sure. And, and let's 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 talk about the politics of that in a second. But first, <laughs> let's talk about how do you actually 
two artists who are known for a certain sound. Uh, how do you come together? How do you build a back-to-back -back set, you know, a day or two before the festival? Because everybody's busy. Oh my God. Um, well, first of all, I think fans will appreciate that it is one of the hardest parts of our job. Like, but get, to getting told you're doing a back-to-back, -back, especially with someone you don't know very well, um, is one of the most gut-wrenchingly nerve-wracking things, especially if you're playing like a larger festival stage. Because it can go very, very wrong. Well, and that's maybe the first point too, is that it's, I, I feel like a lot of people just assume that like you call up your buddy and you're like, hey, let's do a back to back. That was just not at all what happens. That's not what happens. What happens is an agent will be in conversation with like the talent buyer for a project, like a festival or a company, an event company. And they'll go, oh, we want so-and-so. And they'll be like, dude, like this slot isn't a good look. So-and-so and so. And they'll be like, well, what if we throw in so-and-so? And like, it's like a whole back-to-back -back conversation. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a back-to-back. -back. <laughs> nice but one. It's, nice. A, it's a whole conversation <laughs> about like leverage and using two names to boost each other. And like, I do understand from like an agent perspective. Um, but basically that's what happens. We really don't know anything about it until they present it to us as like a yes or no question. Right. So they'll go do you want to play this back-to-back 7 p.m. slot with so-and-so? And usually I'll say no. <laughs> yeah. And then they'll say, you should do it. And I'll say, I don't want to. And they'll say, you should really do it. And I'll be like, fine. <laughs> and that's usually how it works. <laughs> um, with Sasuke, I said yes, of to course, be fair. Like, to be completely transparent, I was like, yes, that sounds good. I can show you the text. But um, in general, I usually just say, no, this is offensive. Um, because I, I like to be me. But so when that happens... Artists will typically like contact each other and be like, okay, what are we going to do? And if the, if the pairing is really good, like must die and Eptic, you would go, okay, like what songs are you going to play? We, which temp we'll go, should we do some like, you know, dubstep to a uh, house and like, we'll just do those two sections. Cause that's like, cause you know, their music. Right. But if it's someone like, um, that you don't know very well, then that conversation becomes more of like, what do you play? Like, can, like uh, I've also had to like look up people's music before and be like, <laughs> okay, let's, let's suss all this out. And what am I going to play? Right. And then it becomes a matter of like figuring out how that person DJs because that, that format can be really different. Like some people use sync. Some people don't use sync. Some people play dubstep at 140. Some people play it at 150. Like yep. people do all kinds of different stuff. And that process is so stressful because it's usually done like a week before the show or even the day before the show. Yeah. And then you got to make... If you're me, I get really worried about reliability. I just like don't trust people to do their fucking job. Sure. No, I mean, there's no specific artist. I've never had it happen. Right. But like, you know, I've definitely shown up and been like, hey, are we going to plan this out? And they're like, no. And you're like, <laughs> okay. And then you just freestyle it, which sounds easy, but it is not easy. Because as any DJ knows, if your shit isn't gridded up right and like processed right and the quantize button is on, you have a train wreck. It's oh, like yeah. a whole mess. It's a whole mess. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Not to mention the fact that when you're playing as a solo artist, if, if you go off script and you decide you're going to freestyle your set, that's one thing because you, at least in your brain, have the image of like where this is heading, the points you want to hit, what you want to do with the crowd. But if you're with somebody else, they can't see what's happening in your brain. You can't see what's happening in their brain. And so, yeah, I've had I've had plenty of times playing with somebody else where we didn't talk about it enough beforehand and they play something. I'm just like, what? What are we yeah, doing? What? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think I think I think something that makes that. My point doesn't really make sense until I mention this. I have been an artist for 10 years as this project. I have songs I have to play. Yeah. And if I don't play them, people will get mad at me. Right. And that's where it gets stressful. It's more like fitting a puzzle. Because honestly, it would be really fun if I could just go up there and play whatever I want and like react to what they're doing. But I can't go up there and just play someone else's music all night. Oh, dude, of course. So I, like, yeah, that's the stressful part is because it's two agendas. We both have to play our songs. How are we going to do it? Right. Yeah. Because if I went up there and just like, if if it were me and Tozoki, for example, and he was like, I just want to play a bunch of drum and bass. I'd be like, yes. Like, let's, I'll just pull all my favorite drum and bass tunes and we'll just freestyle this. Like, it'll be easy and fun. But 
then people would be like, why did I just go see those two people? Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Like what's, what's the identity? What do people take away from it? All that kind of thing. Because I think the goal is to make it one kind of like a little for an hour. It's a super group. Do you have uh, the songs you have to play at this point from your career? Do you ever get sick of it? Any of them? You don't have to name (laughs) names, but (laughs) I used to, I used to really hate playing my song gem shards. It's really old. I know. Um, Yeah. I know that song. Yeah. I used to hate playing it only because, and I used to hate playing it because it felt like everything I was writing was being compared to it. Mm. So I was like, okay, cool. Like, you know, I, I don't know. I feel, I feel like I was, I was definitely younger when I felt that way. And I don't really feel that way about any songs currently. I'm just happy that they did well. Right. But I think at the time, and I'm happy about Gem Shards now, like I'm really glad I wrote that song and, and did it. But for a while, I think when you're feeling kind of like, like you haven't said everything you want to say. And then people say, well, say this same thing again, <laughs> say the same thing again. And you're like, I don't want to. And then you get more defensive about it. And I don't know. I think my attitude's changed a lot about it. Yeah. Now I'm like happy. Dude, I, it's funny. You m- just made me think of, uh, I, I went and saw Nine Inch Nails a couple of weeks ago and yeah. uh, they played, they played the perfect drug. Do you know that song? I do know that song. So so that song I was huge for me in high school. I love that song. And then later, I was kind of like a Nine Inch Nails, like super fan in high school. Okay. And at the time, like Trent Reznor was kind of on record as being like, this song sucks. This is the worst Nine Inch Nails song. And it was always one of my favorites. And then I saw them a couple of weeks ago and they played it, which I didn't think they played it at all. And then I went down this like nerd wormhole and looked it up. And I guess a few years back, he kind of was just like, yeah, I kind of got over myself. People like the song. So now we play. Yeah, the song. exactly. And I was like, great, man. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. I feel like um, if there was a modern equivalent for me, I have a song called Chaos that like it's it's simply overplayed. Sure. But I have to play it because I wrote it. <laughs> well, but I do think song, like man. even I'm even I'm sick of hearing it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I'm like, like a, super grateful. Yeah. And eventually, I don't know. It, I feel like you could start, you know, certain sets, you don't, you rotate certain things in or out, you know. Not that one. <laughs> well, not yet, maybe. Not I, that one, but I have. I don't play anything older than 2018. Do you have, this is another related question. Do you have, see the same people at shows? Are you at that point yet where like a lot of people have come to see you a bunch of times? Mm -hmm. I've actually made friends with a few people because of it. That's awesome, man. Yeah. So I definitely... So another thing is, I think social media is interesting because I will remember fans from the internet as well. Sure. Like there are people that have been fans the whole time that I still know. I'll see their handle and just be like, that's so cool. And I know that like, like, you know me pretty well. Like I'm being genuine when I say that like that stuff means a lot to me. Like yeah. seeing people that like went for the whole ride and stuck through every twist and turn, every bad day, every good day, like it's I'm a person. So like my moods shift and like my taste shifts. Yeah. And those people were like not just in it for like the song, but in it for the idea. And like I really appreciate that. And you see a lot of that. And you see a lot of people do it live too. Like, um, there are a few people that have traveled like between dates on oh, tours yeah. and stuff. And like, I, I like change up my set specifically for them. And like, I really appreciate that. Those kind are of the stuff. people that matter, man. Those are like Still, the core, yeah. <laughs> like that's the, I just, because I went and saw nine inch nails a couple of weeks ago, I've been thinking about it. Cause the crowd there was kind of this like aging goth crowd. And it almost had like a Grateful Dead vibe where you could tell those people had been going to those shows for like 25 years. Yeah, And and I was like, man, it, it, it rewired my brain a little bit in terms of how we think about like getting people's attention and the people who support what we do. And I'm like, all you gotta do is get that core Obviously, Nine Inch Nails core is huge, but like... Oh, sure, but it's still the same thing. It's it's the people... Uh, uh, Stephen King calls him the constant reader. Okay, I like that. Yeah, I like him too. And he's always talking to the constant reader, which is me. <laughs> you know, like it's yeah. the people who care, uh, the people who pick up every book he puts out. Right. The people who may not like a book, but they come back to the next one and they're like, well, let's see. Like, you know... Stephen King can write 20 bad books and it's not going to sway my opinion of him as a writer. Yeah, dude, a hundred percent. Yeah. And I think I have bands that I'm like that with. Like I have a few bands that like 
they can kind of do no wrong anymore. Like, I just know that I really dig what they're always kind of about. I feel that way about like the 1975. Yeah, I like artists like that too. I have plenty of those where you just kind of believe in them as creatives. And I know that maybe I'm not going to like every single thing they do, but it's just like, nah, I like, I like your brain basically. Yeah. A hundred percent. It's how I feel about like Hudson Mohawk. It's how I feel about... He's a um, great example. Oh God. Yeah, man. His new album is fucking crazy, dude. I've only heard three songs from it. It's. I just started listening to it yesterday when I was running errands. It's well worth a listen, man. It's like he, he kind of went crazy on that one. I need to check it out. I'm like, man, I had my heyday with him. And like when I first started this project, like him and Rusty just like... Oh, dude. Sold me on everything. I was just like, yes, okay. Apparently I'm Scottish now. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I got to move to Scotland and deal with this shit. (laughs) Um, So good. I feel that way about like Sam Gellitry as well. Ooh, yeah. Just like forward thinking. Also Scottish. Yeah, what is it with Scottish people? I don't know, man. Calvin Harris? Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's the thing. Calvin Harris. (laughs) Tasoki? Tasoki's Scottish. Is he really? Yeah. He's not British? He's both. Really? I never knew that. Man, I, but he doesn't have the accent. I feel like... He can. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah. He can. Fair enough. I'm going to make him do it the next time I see mm-hmm. him. <laughs> That's what we did all weekend. Uh, no, he's he's Scottish. I had no idea. That's crazy. I had no idea until this weekend. But yeah, he's super, super like private. Yeah, for sure. Which I kind of respect, honestly. It's, like, it's smart. It's smart, but it also... I don't know. There's so much in our industry of just like everyone feels like they have to talk about themselves all the time or tell you everything about their lives. And at a certain I it's not that I mind when people do that, but at a certain point, I'm like, I don't need to know. <laughs> yeah, I don't I really don't need to know, like, what you're doing at all times. Right. <laughs> what I like to know about is like the stuff that is like actually something I can relate to. Like if someone's like, hey, I've been having a lot of success with this synthesizer. I'd be like, oh, that's cool. Or yeah. if someone's like, hey, I got a dog. I'd be like, that's cool. I love dogs. Ex- yeah. But if like, someone's like, yeah, <laughs> like, hey, man, like <laughs> brunch went crazy. I'm just like, I don't care. <laughs> yeah, dude, that's exactly right. Yeah. If someone wants to tell me something weird that they're excited about in their life, like just a random thing, that's great. I love hearing yeah. about people's weird interests. But yeah, yes. I, I don't care at all about like the the social media the content aspect the content of our baby. lives yeah not interested you know I actually do have a soft spot for content and I'd like to bring that up okay let's go do you remember during the pandemic when Nicky Romero posed in front of his car God it was so so good <laughs> that's the good shit man that's the good shit like my favorite thing in the world is like when people are all about the content to the point where they don't even understand how inhuman the whole thing is. Oh, dude. Wait, what are the... We, we can do highlights. What are the the top top five uh, EDM content moments? I think the Nicky Romero car, the David, number one. David Guetta... Mm-hmm. David Guetta, David Guetta, Guetta George shout. Floyd shout out. Yeah, shout out to his family. Oh, my God. <laughs> that might be... That's number one. <laughs> that's number one. I also think... Yeah, the Nicky Romero car picture for sure. Yeah, that one was great. That one's good. I think Carbon showing his bare ass for likes. Oh, I remember that. That was a. I never really got the story on that one. I was. I mean, there is a story. I'm sure. Yeah. It was just kind of a misguided, like, yeah, this is how you do it, man. Right. Moment. Right. Yeah. And I'm not. And, yeah, uh, I'm not trying to like you know talk no, about anybody's I mean, business, but yeah, I do remember when that happened. I saw. I mean, that there's ass. not really much business to talk about. It was basically like this is how you get likes. And I guess it worked. I mean, I, I did mean, see his butt. There's I, nothing wrong with butts and there's nothing wrong with showing your butt. Like, do it, do whatever you want. It was just like, didn't expect it, I think. Sure. But that was good. I just like the discourse around it was really funny because right. he was like, I can do whatever I want. And everyone was like, I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like nobody was mad. Everybody was just kind of like, yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. There's a sure. Brother. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I like that. Yeah, um, that is. Yeah. In that lens, I like it too. <laughs> as far as con- uh, Kill the Noise did an accidental one that I'll always remember. The one where his phone's too close to his face? Oh, no. That one's real good. Oh, I like that no, one. No, the one where the, the embassy photoshopped his head onto a man wearing a suit. Wait, what? Dude, for like a visa photo for Korea. 
<laughs> somebody photoshopped his head onto a man wearing a suit. <laughs> and it looked like a golden eye character. <laughs> He looked like and he a, posted that one day, and I've never forgotten. Like it. Odd Job, it was like <laughs> he, yeah, he looks like Jaws or something, like like Odd Job or like oh yeah. my god, yeah, he looks like a char- like on a character select, right, 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 god. like Natalia, yeah, That's it was wild. So funny. Um, speaking, you know, I'm gonna derail. No, let's you go. Know, Golden Eyes coming to Switch. You know, okay, I was actually about to ask you how you felt about this too, because here's the thing: I've been talking to friends. We, uh, some of my old like high school buddies and middle school, even we played a lot of GoldenEye back in the day. But the thing was the, the controller on the GameCube was like, not, not ideal. And so the controls for that game are real weird. And I don't know how they're going to reboot. Like they're going to have to redo the entire control scheme for that game to bring it back. Yes. So Yes. So the original N64 version... Or yes, I'm sorry, the, N64, not GameCube. Well, I yeah. think they ported it as well. I can't remember if but, they did or not. No, I think but there was some weird the, the weird controller I meant to say was the N64 yeah. controller. So, I'm using my prop. Right. On the Switch, the C buttons on the emulator are as, as like, they're like a rotary joystick as opposed to like buttons. Right. So I have no idea how they're going to sort that out. I imagine there will be some like button remapping. I have no idea how they're going to nail it. But I do know that I did not grow up playing that game very much. Mm. And so this will be my first... I'll finally get to like have my glory day in the hot sun. You'll probably have a better experience, honestly, because that that game... I mean, it was a super fun game back in the day, too. But looking back, I, I don't think it would hold up if you just went to the N64 and played it now. Yeah, maybe. I, I replayed Turok a couple years ago. And was like, wow, these controls are absolutely dog shit. <laughs> I never played I don't know. Turok, when I was Because yeah. I was such an N64 kid, but like my purview was more like Zelda, Mario. Right. Um, and then I was like PS1, like JRPGs and stuff. So like shooters weren't really my thing. The first shooter I ever played through was Halo 4. Oh, wow. Four. That's Four. crazy. Yes. That's the first shooter I ever really played. This, my friend Descender sat me down and was like, you're going to play Halo. And I was like, I don't want to. <laughs> He's like, you're going to play Halo. So I played four, then I played all the other ones. They, they're so good, man. The original they Halo are. 8, like oh, a year of my life. Yeah. Yeah. The original Halo is incredible. I, I feel like shooters for me, when I was younger, I avoided like anything that was like what I considered to be like hyper-masculine. Mm. So like Power Rangers weren't for me. Like GoldenEye wasn't for me. Wrestling wasn't for me. Which is like, funny, look, because now looking back, I'm like, Power Rangers is not that masculine. <laughs> no, not at all. Power, dude, it's all about bulk and skull, man. <laughs> yeah, I love that stuff now. And I, and I think it's all cool now. But when I was a kid, I think I was like very much averse to masculinity or what I perceived as masculinity. Was, that, was it a conscious thing at the time? Or was it just kind of you reacting to your surroundings, do you think? It became a conscious thing when I was older, but I had always been that way. Mm. So I think I realized it as I got older. That's interesting. It is interesting. I'm I'm still I'm still that way. <laughs> <laughs> do you do I know you do like therapy and all that, right? Mm-hmm. Have you have you done a fair amount of kind of delving into the past, the childhood stuff and figuring out where all that shit yeah. comes from? Yeah, a hundred percent. It's like um it's kind of like my the thing I'm most passionate about. It's like music and like figuring it out. Mm. <laughs> I think the two things I care most about in this world are music and figuring it out. <laughs> <laughs> well, the the music part's going great. How's the figuring it out part going? Going great. I'm a, nice. I'm a happy, content guy. That's good, man. Do you yeah. do you feel like you kind of have like figured yourself out to a certain extent at this point? I think I think it's going to be a work in progress for the rest of my life. But I do always, think that like. Yeah. In terms of like feeling comfortable in my own skin and like uh, knowing who I am, what I stand for, where I come from and how it affected me. Yeah, I think I like have a pretty good grasp on like Lee. Yeah. It's just a matter of like the things I care about now are like, okay, well, how do I take those experiences and use them in ways that are like beneficial? And how do I break habits that like formed as like a way of that? Like, I don't know. I think... Growing up the way I did, which was a very interesting way to grow up. Uh, which, by the way, we kind- talked about on previous podcasts. Go listen to the previous Must Die podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah tell them about it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, uh, I think growing up single mom, 
mental health issues and stuff like that kind of put me in a pretty like, I got to protect myself at all times kind of way. And I'm, I'm now focusing very hard on like becoming a very like, I just go with the flow. Like everything's okay. Kind of vibe. I don't feel like everyone's out to, out to get me. Right. Right. Cause was that the <laughs> assumption basically is like somebody walks into a room and you're instantly kind of suspicious. No, it was more of a feeling of like, always feeling like something bad is about to happen to me. Oh, interesting. It's it's less that I thought people were bad, but more that I thought that like nothing good would happen to me. Yeah, just an impending it was like a different doom feeling. kind of thing. Impending doom, yeah. And it manifested for a long time as like panic attacks. I used to have like panic attacks on stage and shit. And then um, what is that? once I got rid what of those. What does that feel like? To have oh, it on not good, man. But like obviously not good, but like what's it like to have it on stage? Uh, it feels like a psychedelic drug. Really? Yeah, because your your adrenaline goes crazy and your heart rate goes up and like your depth perception goes like, shoo. Like it flattens kind of? It flattens. You go to Cartoon World. Wow. And everything's kind of like slow motion, but sta- but stable speed as well. It's really horrible. I hate it. Uh, I mean, yeah, I f- I'm I'm not trying to glamorize it at all. I'm sorry that no, happened. No, 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 no. It's, but it's totally fine. were you able, can you still finish the performance that way? Like, do, how do I you always get did, through yeah. it? I always did. Yeah. I would usually end up fixing it by admitting by admitting it on the mic. Oh, wow. If I were just like, yo, I'm having a panic attack right now, then like no one would really care because it was like at a nightclub. They thought I would just be like, put your hands up. <laughs> right. And then I would be like, okay, well, at least everyone knows that I'm struggling and like I'm not alone. Mm. That's yeah. that's kind of beautiful, actually, man. Yeah, that's it's, a- you know, people, I I believe very strongly that like in a group setting, people's inherent call is to do good. I do think that it's really easy to make people be bad. But I do think that like, if someone is struggling, our nature is to help. Yeah, I think that's right. Especially when that person is like being very open about it, you know? I don't remember anyone ever responding. <laughs> I think the last time I had a panic attack on stage was Madison, Wisconsin. Okay. that's Years ago. This would have been like 2017 or 2018. That's that's a funny city to have a panic attack in. <laughs> I like Madison. I like Madison too, yeah. I I had never I don't think I had ever spent much time there. When I went, I went with some friends of mine uh, from Chicago and I had like a nice time and I think I think Jamie Lax was there, maybe Dr. Ozzy. Mm. I, I think that was it, city, but it was man. it was really nice. Yeah. Uh and I went around town and I was like this is a really beautiful town square it's so pleasant yeah like yeah there, there was a time when i was living in chicago when i was still just a local dj and uh madison's just a couple hours away from chicago as you know and so you know i had like a few local residencies in chicago and then through that it kind of expanded and i ended up doing this like monthly residency thing out in madison for like a year and so just yeah once a month i'd drive out there hang out for a night play some anonymous bar gig. It was great, man. Madison's fun. Yeah, I want, you know, I would like, I think I have an idea. I would like to have a completely separate alias where I can just play around Seattle. Dude, uh, I, with, again, without saying too much, I'm kind of doing that right now uh, where I'm at and it's pretty great. I would love to be able to just like show up and be like, just the noise in the background at a bar. Dude, it's the best, honestly. It's like... Yeah, it, it, I, I miss open format DJ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you... you Did you start off doing that? Am I right? Kind of, yeah. yeah. Like, uh, kind of. Like, if you recall, it was back in the day when, like, when you were, like, when Blog House was kind of a mixture of, like, indie rock and house and Blog House and pop. Yeah. It was, like, all of it together. Yep. Because like Alex Metric really towed the line and it was a lot of Alex Metric in the set and like a lot of like Major Laser and like a lot of, you know, it was like the early days. Oh yeah, absolutely. So, still playing the Polka Dots Be More remix, baby. <sighs> Such a killer. You could play that right now. That's what I was just I thinking about. I listened to it about, the other day. Dude, I was just thinking about Polka Dots the other day too. Like the Be More remix is also crazy. The Oliver Twist remix. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All of that. Yeah, yeah. You could play it right now. There's certain songs where... I feel like this is part of the art of DJing that maybe gets lost a little bit when it's when it's just so focused on the artist's original music. But there's mm-hmm. so we have so much history, decades of dance music history with bangers throughout every single year. 
And 99% of those are lost to history and will never be played again. Like Mm -hmm. all you got to do is go back a few years, figure out the banger that nobody's playing anymore, bring it back. And it's a cheat code, man. I think, I think Polka Dots Oliver Twist remix holds up extremely well. Yeah. It was also like really aggressive for the time. Oh, dude. Yeah. I also think, and it's interesting if we're talking about things that were like really big bangers from years ago, like Seabat is like trending <laughs> on TikTok, so the Hudson Mohawk tune. Yeah. And I was just thinking about that and I was like, I think, I think maybe bringing back some older stuff would be cool. Like there's this old Jent and John's tune. Was it Jenton Johns that did turn up? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that needs to come back. Oh, dude, absolutely. I mean, and there's... I know Kill the Noise played it for ages, though. Well, because he did the remix. Yeah, yeah. Which is a fucking crazy... That's a super aggressive remix that you could absolutely yeah. still play now. There's a lot of good trap riffs. Yeah. I was about to say, like, there's... Iso Exo, like, his originals kind of sound like what I'm about to say. But if if you went back and took like some of the the real real good trap the the ones that have the iconic riffs in them yeah and just redid the drums on a lot of them just made it a little harder like a little more modern i mean you you could have a crazy crazy set of just those oh 100 percent. i've been waiting for years to see what the next iteration of trap is going to be because for a minute it was like the hybrid stuff with dubstep and like I wasn't like that was okay. Yeah. But like I want to see I want to see how you can push that like simplicity again. Dude. But make it modern. And then ISO XO happened and I was like, all right, there it is. Yeah. The whole because then you've also got like G Jones and like Eprom and like who are also doing incredible stuff. But uh, yeah, I just heard that new G Jones track that's like essentially a straight dubstep tune. Yeah, I heard that too. And I was because I know he used to do a lot more like dubstep flavored things. And when I heard it, I was just like, that is such a clever, clever take on it because it sounds so modern, but you're using nothing but like 303s and amen breaks. Yep. Yep. I mean, absolute bad shit. You want to talk about like making a lot out of simplicity? I think G Jones is fucking phenomenal with that. A hundred percent. I also, I think there's a few people that that get away with being super simple and it being like super, super effective. But I do think G Jones is the one that's like the king of just like, here's a sample, here's a break and here's one synth. Yeah. What can we do with delay? <laughs> right, <laughs> you <know? yeah>, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> like you hear a lot of really crazy shit. And like, obviously like EPROM is another one, you know, when you talk about one, you always end up talking about the other, which I might not be fair to either of them, but like, another king of simplicity. Oh yeah, absolutely. And, but in a totally different way too, Mm -hmm. like his tunes are always like, I feel like his tunes are instead of like, here's these three elements, let's push them together for him. It's almost like, here's this one element. Let's fuck this up as much as possible. Yeah. Here's this one element. How dysphoric can we become? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. How, how, what is the, what is a song? (laughs) (laughs) that's i love that that's i mean that's where that's where like my my artist brain likes to live but then i don't think i don't think i'm good at executing that part of my artist brain very much i don't know man uh the the last tune uh grave bloom that you put out i liked that it was you know just one drop and then kind of this like breakbeat second half it was like kind of a non-traditional structure but honestly man i would like it made me like it more. It felt rather than just like a, a DJ tune. Like I was like, oh, this is like a song. This is like actually mm-hmm. going somewhere, which not that every DJ tune has to do that. But sure, of course. I, I liked it, man. It had like a, a, an arc to it. It was refreshing. I like intentionally wanted to not A&R myself on that song. So it was kind of just written one step at a time. Just like let it b like i i I distinctly remember i didn't want to like add a bunch of drums to the build-up because i felt like it was growing in intensity and adding drums would like take it out of that and make it feel like a dj tune i just wanted it to get more confusing sounding and then be a drop and then after that i was like okay what should i do for the bridge and i was thinking about it and i was like i don't really want one like i don't have another idea for the drop like that's the idea i had yeah and so i just kind of let it meander and then i was like oh well what if what if I just 
take this this mood I've just made with this bridge and like roll with it. And I was like, well, this sounds like a kind of like a new rave breaks tune. So like, I'll just go with it. Yep. And I did, and it was fun. And there's a few, uh, like, I've, I'm like putting the finishing touches on a few things now where it's like, I'll get the idea done and I won't push it. I won't be like, gotta make this three and a half minutes long. Yep. I'll just be like, what else could come from this same place? So a couple of the things I'm doing now kind of start as one thing and end up as another. And I'm really enjoying that structure because it means that there's like, it means that like I'm getting the most out of not just sound design, but like motif and idea and mood. And I really appreciate, I like, I really appreciate being able to sit in that longer. Yeah, dude, absolutely. And and the thing is, I think, I think listeners appreciate that too, you know, because I do at a live show, you can edit it up to be any way you want. You can give it 20 drops if you want, yeah. but then to go home and listen to it, stream it, that kind of thing. I'd much rather hear, you know, you hear the drop, you hear the the main theme or whatever, but I'd much rather hear, you know, the artist's actual take on it rather than that kind of edited version. Yeah. Which makes me think off the cuff, you know, when you used to have DJ mixes and like regular versions of songs? Yeah. Not a bad idea. No, it's really not. It's really not at all, man. I was talking, do you know uh, the uh, Spencer Brown, the house guy? Yes, of course, of course, of course. Yeah, he's, he, was a, he was a dubstep guy for a while. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I think yeah. he's a little embarrassed about. But <laughs> Oh, he was so good at, well, I, I know him through AFK, Jimmy. Oh, okay. Um, and, and Spencer, Spencer was um, fantastic and is fantastic. He's an incredible producer. Great dude. Absolutely incredible. Uh, and a guy I like to talk to. And he... He was talking to me about how he always has arguments anytime he's putting out music because he'll make like a 12 minute song and then his team will be like, OK, and we need like the Spotify edit. And he's like, no, I'm not making an edit of this. Like, This is a piece of art that I made. And yeah. this is it's 12 minutes long because that's how long I made it. He's like, I'm not editing it to, you know, appease a streaming platform, that kind of thing. And. I, I see both sides of the argument, but I always respected the the hardline stance on it, you know. If presented with a hardline stance versus an industry idea, I will always choose the hardline stance. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I do think I do think that if you write a 12 minute song and you write it knowing that it is exactly that and you don't have already a conception in your mind of, oh, they'll make the three minute mix. Don't make one. Yeah. Go fuck, go fuck yourself. <laughs> so what <laughs> how, What can you say about the new music that you're working on right now? Is this like, is it part of a bigger project? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, nice. it's an album. Oh, sick. Um, yeah, well, luckily for us, uh, we just announced it, so. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Damn, uh, where I was think, I? I think we posted um, like maybe an hour ago the next single art. Okay. And then we also said it was part of the album. Oh, so. sick. So I can talk about it now. I haven't been able to talk about it for like a fucking year. Oh, nice. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm basically done with the album. It's different. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of, there's a lot of hard dance on it. And there's dubstep, like there's obviously dubstep and there's house and there's techno and there's hard dance and it's a lot. <laughs> there's <Yeah>. gabber. <laughs> That's great, dude. Well, cause yeah. you, you've been playing a lot of hard dance at your shows. I know that. And I feel like you've been, I don't know if it's intentional, but you've been priming your audience to go a little bit more in that direction. It's like been intentional. Reposting people who complain about you playing too much of it, all of that, yeah. which I love. Yeah. Uh, that, I think that's just me not being able to fucking like stand people like that and losing my mind. But I mean, sure. I, I, <laughs> and I, I, would, I wish it was something a bit more adult and calculated, but it's usually <laughs> just me being like, come the fuck on. <laughs> but um, yeah. I'm I'm really stoked. Like live, I feel like there's been this really, really cool shift for me where I feel like I've been really engaging audiences because it's something they didn't expect. And then through that, it now feels like it's something they do expect. And I feel so free. Right. And I feel like I can kind of do whatever I want. And for a long time, it felt like I was always pigeonholed, as I said, because everyone had this idea of what I was. But my idea of what I was, was that I was everything. Right. So it was really hard for me. And then, you know, I was, I decided to go down this route where I kind of incorporate a lot of hard dance into my set. And for the first year, it was like, oh, that's surprising. So people thought it was fun. 
And then a little after a while, they realized I wasn't like taking it out of my set, and it <laughs> wasn't like a trend. It. I just yeah. kept going, yeah. and that it was slowly growing as a part of my set. And now my set's literally half and half, and that's really really fun. And so with this album, after like that whole last tour I did, I was like, I'm just gonna do that. And then I did, and it's like the most fun I've ever had writing a record. That's great. So like. It's not as like the album's not as conceptual as like Crisis Vision. Like it's not as like serious, right? I think because Crisis Vision was written during like one of the bleakest points of my entire life, mean, everyone's life. Yeah, where you're just like in a house. Like, are we all gonna die or like what's going on? But then this was like this is club records because we are touring again, and it's like it's music, it's dance music, and yeah, there's there's like parts like Grave Bloom and other things where it meanders off and and does music music right but like the album is definitely me being like i love dance music i'm so thankful for dance music like i'm so glad it's back like here's all the dance music i love Mm. and so i'm really stoked about it Uh, like super stoked about it i think that's the the key to all of it man like even back when we were talking about tosoki at the start of this i you know another person who wears those influences on his sleeve i think that's that's what I want out of any artist at this point is just be like, show me all the shit you like, you know, yeah. like that's that's all I want. Like I'm I'm kind of over the hyper focused like, you know, you come you come to me for this one thing and that's what we're going to do kind of thing. And there's people who do it great, but yeah, I, I get bored with it a lot easier. Me too. I think I was just talking about this with my friend Brandon. I think people come to artists because they are, because of their taste. I think people come to artists that they invest in. Yeah. Like the people that show up to your shows, the people we were talking about, the core, those people are there for your taste. A hundred percent. I mean, that's the old school men, like that's how it always was with DJs. That's how it's always mm. been, you know, way before DJs were known as producers or artists who made their own shit. Like DJs would be famous just because of their taste, you know? A hundred percent. Yeah. And I, and I subscribed to that as well. That's how I came up. Like a lot of my favorite people to see out and about aren't necessarily like producers or if they are producers, they're not the best producers. Like I think some people just have really good taste. I have all these memories as a kid of going to raves, seeing somebody DJ and, you know, I wouldn't know a single song And then I would get obsessed with something I heard and try to track it down. The hunt of it was super exciting. Oh, yeah. And then when you finally got it, like how you had to finagle it. Oh, man. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, yeah. A dub plates, man. There there was a... I can't remember if I've talked about this on the podcast before or not. But I mean, there was a period of a couple of years in college where like pretty much all of my money was just being sent to like Amsterdam to buy hardcore records. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> no, you never told me that. <laughs> That's pretty good, though. Yeah, no, I still have them all. I don't think they're really worth anything, but they are rare. You know, it's like it's yeah. still shit that I'm not sure exists digitally. Once you got the old Thunderdome mixes, some of those uh, there was there were a couple of the. Do you know the label Mokum? M O K U M. Yes. Yeah, a bunch of their shit. Uh, yeah, some of the. It's like Gabber. Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, I was, I was all about it. <laughs> oh man, it's so funny to me. The blunt, like, it's so funny when people talk about Gabber and hardcore and old school hardcore, and I'm like, it's the same thing, baby. Yeah. Oh, dude. Yeah. I was, <laughs> I was never. I don't know if it's just because I'm too lazy to learn the differences between like sub sub genres or there are. I'm uh, just being a jerk. There, no, there are, but also there aren't. Re- like, it's such a fluid thing to try to say, like. I always got annoyed with, like when the trap movement got started up and uh, it would always be weird to me when people would be like, oh, no, that's that's hybrid trap. That's not trap. You know, people would kind of make up these terms that eventually maybe meant something. But to me, I'm like, I just I don't care, man. I don't have time to figure out why you call it one thing. OK, I get it. And I'm actually on your side of thinking. <laughs> I <But>. think <laughs> I think there needs to be like degrees of separation for it to matter. Yeah. Like a good example is like, is like, uh, like screamo and then like emo. Okay. Those are two different things. Yeah, that's true. You're They're right. They're totally two different things. They are. Now, 
Now, metalcore and deathcore, slightly different things. Yeah. I mean, one goes low and slow, and one is essentially just like it, shirtless Swedish <laughs> death metal. <laughs> so like, yeah, because deathcore, that's just like they're singing with the death metal voice, right? No, deathcore is like, uh, deathcore is when it's like, it's so hard to describe. <laughs> deathcore is a lot more like low, slow, there's breakdowns, right. like it gets like kind of wacky. It's like, I don't know, there's a, it's kind of hard to describe in actual musical terms, but like deathcore is more like uh, suicide silence, whereas like death metal or uh, metalcore is more like as I lay dying. So like right, right, right. as I lay dying is metalcore, Carnifex is deathcore. Sure, and it's just kind of like the line is a bit blurred because both things happen, but one has got a more different attitude. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. I get it. Yeah, I, don't know, I come from all that shit. I, I used to know a lot more about it. I don't know what's going on these days. Me neither, man. There's only there's only a few bands I really really follow as like a fan at this point. Mm. Like I always hear some new music and get stoked on it and check out an album that kind of thing. But as far as like following the scene itself. I, I can't really be bothered anymore. I still keep up with a few bands. Like I still like every time like Wolves in the Throne Room put out a record, I'm like, it's black metal time. And then every time Watain puts out a record, I'm like, it's black metal time. <laughs> I was following the Black Dahlia Murder, rest in peace. But I was I was like a big fan of Verminous, the last record they put out. I didn't really hear it. Oh, dude. It was, it was so good. I don't know. How, like they got a new guitarist for that album and it was like almost like neoclassical mm. without it being cheesy. It was really cool. Interesting. Um, but then Trevor passed away, which was very, very sad. Like, I did. Yeah. yeah, I did hear about that, man. That was really sad. Yeah. But I don't know. I don't follow a lot. Um, there's there's a few bands that I'll go out of my way to pay attention to in every genre. People that I just like, I trust their taste. Right. Like Tribulation is a band I really love. I don't know um, them either. I, I'm, I'm pretty on the record that I'm like a big fan of Ghost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've We've but talked like, about that, I think. I think people, I feel like people judge me for that. I feel like people think that I like the equivalent of like fucking Green Day or some shit, <laughs> but it's not. <laughs> whatever, whatever, dude. It's okay. It's all right if you like Green Day. <laughs> and here I am talking about how I love the 1975 and it's like right. they are literal pop bands. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, but they're so good at it. Both you and I love a lot of pop music anyway, man. I like, really do. I don't know. For me, it's I'm also over judging any of that kind of shit. Yeah. Man. What does it fucking matter, man? It doesn't matter at all, man. I'm not I'm not quite at the point where I'm like a Coldplay apologist. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. There are lines. Like, like I can't get into Stained and shit, but yeah. I can like absolutely appreciate people who are like, I just like this rock music. And I'm like, you know what? Fucking great, man. That's great, man. You smell bad. <laughs> like, good job on you. I love all my juggalos and juggalettes. Yo, did you go see Weird Al yet? Has that happened? Is it out? No, no. because we were talking about you were going to go oh, see yeah. Weird Al. Yeah, I did. How was it? It was amazing. It was great. I got to say hi to Emo. His set, like uh, he opened for Weird Al. Yeah, Emo, so Emo Phillips for anybody listening, the opener. Incredible One of the funniest comedian. stand-up sets I've ever seen in my life. He's so fucking funny. He's so fucking funny. And he, dude, he had the crowd like around his pinky. It was so good. I believe. I that. mean, a bit, a full, like a full, full set too. Okay. It was incredible. And then um, Weird Al came on, and he did. It was the full band, but it was kind of like they were all doing like a fake unplugged. Well, yeah, because he this tour he's doing it's like not the not the hits, right? Yeah, it's kind of no like hits. deep dive Weird Al. But he played some of my favorite songs, like uh, the horse. I forget the, if the song is called "That's Your Horoscope for Today." Oh man, it was off running with scissors. It was so good. It's I, like a ska tune. He yeah, played that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that. Oh, he did a bunch of stuff, but he didn't do any of the covers. It was pretty good. That's pretty fun, man. That's... It was pretty good. I mean, he is pitch perfect. <sighs> the band was on fire. He's a fucking road dog, man. That that man can sing, straight up. But he yeah. also tours. He tours more than we do, like more than any DJ. I, like, dude, that tour. I looked at the. I looked at the ad mat, and I was just like, "Holy shit!" It's like a year and a half tour on a butt. Like the whole, like playing every night. It's fucking crazy. I know, and and he's not young. No, no, he's no. Not. And on top of that, they're doing this movie, <laughs> right? God. And I think he's in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he was definitely involved heavily, whether he's yeah. in it or not. Oh, that shit looks... Did you see the trailer? Oh, yeah, dude. Oh, man, that looks really good. Let's go. Uh, yeah, man. I man. love Daniel Radcliffe. Dude, Daniel Radcliffe is great. The movie, like, I could, at first I thought it was more of, like, a serious biopic. 
And then so did I. And, and then when I saw the trailer, I was like, oh, let's go. Let's do this. It reminds me of Norm McDonald's autobiography. Oh my God. So, Have you read it? Yeah, it's so fucking good. So you know that it's like just a lie. Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, Norm McDonald's autobiography, I bought it thinking it was a serious autobiography. I think a lot of people did. And I was like, I was like, oh my God, Arnie Lang, like, my God. Yeah. <laughs> or Artie Lang or whatever the fuck his name is. And I was just like, wow, this is some deep shit. And then I realized like, there's no way this is true. Yeah, because the deeper you go, because it, it's it's not absurd when you start. It's only as no. you keep going where you're like, each little passage pushes the believability a little more. Oh, it went to, it got to the point where I was just like, okay. <laughs> and then I looked it up and realized it wasn't true. <laughs> <laughs> and then with the with the film, I thought that it was going to be this like, oh, we're going to talk about like Dr. Demento and, right. and the whole coming up of Weird Al. And then I looked at the trailer and I was like, he's like, boozing it up with Madonna, which I know never happened. Oh, definitely not. I don't think he no. drinks. <laughs> I don't think he does either. I don't know. I don't think so. I mean, he's certainly like, I didn't see him drink at the show. Yeah, I know. I think I, I've heard him on a couple podcasts. I think he's sober. I think he's like a very kind of straight and narrow dude. It's Yeah, I mean, me too, man. Yeah, man. <laughs> it's good. I mean, if, if you're going to do a fucking year and a half tour playing every night, you kind of have to be. You got to take care of that instrument. Dude. Okay. So I, this is something else. So you're, are you on or are you about to start the Feral Fantasy Tour? Debatable. Yeah. <laughs> that tour cracks me up because I've been on it for a year. Right. We talked about this when I saw you last too. Yeah. When you saw me in, in DC. <laughs> yeah. Which is, okay. This is another. That was fun. Oh, that was so fun, man. I had a great time hanging with you I that night. I had a great night. time too. Yeah, that was that was the best. That's like exactly yeah. what I want out of a DJ friend <laughs> hang. <laughs> yeah, just hanging out. We we go a place and then we go home. Yeah, Great. exactly, man. I, uh, yeah, we, I, we talk uh, for a long time. You play yeah. some hard style. We go home. <laughs> yeah, I um I've been on this tour for like a year. It feels like. Well, and so this is one thing we were talking about, and it's another thing that I don't think everybody understands. Like, you know, you're like, I'm announcing this brand new tour, which is essentially it's like, it's well, no, tour. I'm just packaging up the next couple months of dates that I have. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's like it's yes. not Anno announcing a tour is the same thing as saying here's where I'm going soon. Right. <laughs> yeah. It just, it just sounds better if you can remember chunks of your life. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And I, it makes total sense because, you know, it's like a thing people can get excited about, like the tours coming to town, yeah. that kind of thing. It also does kind of, it does kind of give me a framework in which to work. Right. Like the Feral Fantasy Tour is very obviously like, it's the album era. So I can be like, for the Feral Fantasy Tour, I will do this. And then yeah. when, when the next big bat comes around, I don't know what that will be. Probably like the, uh, the Daddy's Dick Secret the, Tour. The like, Rabid Rampage. Yeah. yeah, the Rabid Rampage. <laughs> or like the... the, the Wait, what, what were or, you about to say? Well, I'm already thinking. Now I'm thinking of them. Did you the say Oral Daddy's Oracle Secret tour. Dick? <laughs> yeah, Daddy's Dick Secret <laughs> Tour. I don't know. <laughs> Cop Secret. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, cop's I got secret the, tour. I, I am sleeping with a cop's wife tour. Um, <laughs> yeah. Please, that, please name your tour that. That's actually really good. <laughs> that is actually really good. I have a I have a whip hidden somewhere uh, called "I am fucking a cop's wife." I think you said something about the cop's wife on the mic. What I saw, you I, I tend to just repeat things. <laughs> no, it's great. I, I think I sent you that clip before. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, I, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> I, it, di it didn't make it to the album. <laughs> It's probably for the best. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of I have a lot of questionable song titles, but um. But wait, speaking of song titles, uh, this was one thing I wanted to say is just naming the tour "Feral Fantasy." I feel like you you got in about five minutes before the word "feral" kind of like went viral on the internet. I, I've noticed that, like every possums and raccoons and fair and ferality, that all happens. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, you're just using feral because you know you love fucking possums but now i feel like it's you know instead of like hot girl summer it's like feral girl fall you know like it's, it's like kind, feral rat fall yeah like it's turned into like a meme i don't know man you got your finger on the pulse you got in there early i just 
felt like eating flesh, man. <laughs> After 2020, I just want to, I just want to kill. <laughs> I have a thirst for blood. I want people to die. That's a great answer to like when you get the shitty interview question of like, what do you think <laughs> is going to be mean? real big in the next year? And you're like, ah, oh, murder, eating, eating human flesh. I think it's yeah. going to be big. Chugging piss, yeah. my guy. <laughs> you ever just like broken someone's skull open and eaten the goo yeah. inside? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a delicacy. Yeah. Be like, mark yeah, it's my like, words. You know, uh, in, in Japan, there are those like gel drinks. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but it's just somebody's fucking gray matter. I like that. Yeah, for like a little extra protein, you know? Yeah, it's vitamin C, baby. <laughs> Put a little lemon on it. It's like an oyster. <laughs> Weren't you just in Japan? I'm with a little murder. I was, yeah. I was, was just in Tokyo. How was that, man? It was good. It was really nice to go back. I got to see a lot of my friends. I haven't, I've only been there once and man, I want to go back so bad. It's so nice. Yeah, I got to go. I played Camelot. It's a club I had never played before. It was really, really, really fun. And my hosts were really, really nice. And I was only there for two days, which sucked, but I made the most of it. My feet are still sore from it. That's the bad dude. Uh, yeah. When I got back from Tokyo, I was there for like a week and a half, but dude, my feet were dead for like yeah. a week afterwards oh yeah i was really enjoying myself though because i've been like studying my japanese like mega hard so i was like it's time to use this oh that's cool do you yeah. how do you study what do you use uh i use duolingo and there's another app called um i think it's called like bunpo are you do you have a goal in mind with that or is it just kind of a hobby fluency baby i uh that's always a have a lot one. of friends in japan and i like learning things so given an opportunity where I can see there's no path of resistance, I will generally try to learn anything I can. I like that, man. Wait, what the fuck is happening in my camera right now? It's trying to tell you that you're not the focus here. Yeah, I guess not. It's me. <laughs> yeah, there we go. That's yeah, now you're good. Yeah. You're back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's, uh, I'm interested because I, I have a friend who lives in Portland who mm -hmm. just got their kid into this like Japanese immersion school. Ooh. And he's been my friend. The the father has also been studying Japanese for years, and he takes these like uh, I don't these like official uh, tests from uh, another ones, yeah. yeah, from Japan. I forget what they're. Yeah, super hard. But he's been trying to do that for years, man. It's a hard language. I feel like it's not okay. That's good. I f I feel like there's one thing that's hard about the language, which is understanding the context in which to say shit. Mm. Okay. Because you can say one thing one way and the same thing a different way, depending on the context. That's confusing. Like the other day I was, I was talking to somebody about like the difference between like, Hey, like pleased to meet you or like, uh, and I, I was talking about it. And then the person was like, no, that's more like a, please help me. Let's work together. <laughs> okay. But it's like such an abstract concept. It'd be like, if I was like, pleased to meet you, let's work well together as opposed to like, it's nice to meet you. But I never thought about that context. I never thought about it. Well, it's hard. It's hard to read and write though, right? Reading is really easy. Writing is really hard. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's the different alphabets and... Yeah, there's... So most of the time you're going to be using one. And if you're using borrowed words, you're going to be using the other. Okay. So they're both just phonetic. This is just a dumb question. Can you have both alphabets together? Like, or do you, you only yes. write in one and then you only write in the other? So you can... They're together. Okay, interesting. So if I were to say like, I am talking to Willie Joy, it would say I am talking to in one and then Willie Joy in another. Oh, interesting. Let me try this actually, just because I, I think we might have fun with this. So I, I was reading uh, this in interview of a comedian in do you know interview magazine have you ever seen no, that but it sounds like a real magazine it, it actually is it's a it's a good one that literally all they do is like get two people who know each other to interview each other that's really cool yeah it's super cool it's been going for a long time they get like big famous people to do it sometimes and it's super fun but there was just this one where it was this series of like really short questions and i just thought they okay. were interesting questions so let me just fire a few off. You can answer in any way you want. Funny answer, serious answer. I don't think it matters, but I'm just curious. Let's see how this goes. Uh, okay. What do you look forward to? Dying. <laughs> no, I look, for, I look forward to uh, spending time with my son. I look forward to making things and I look forward to seeing things that my friends make. Good answer. Uh, how much stamina do you have? A fair bit of stamina. 
uh, just in general, like energy. I feel like I good. feel like I do okay. <laughs> okay. I feel like I can be. I feel like I can be put through the ringer and make it out all right. That's a good. That's good to know. Actually, it took me a while to learn it, but this tour has taught me a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you kind of have to go through the ringer, and then you know. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, what gives you energy? Creativity. Uh, young. Youth, no, uh, young creativity, <laughs> <Blood>. <laughs> the, the kind that isn't jaded yet, like earnest creativity. Mm, yeah, and potential, Seeing it makes right? me so happy. And it's that potential too, right? Where you're like, oh, like I thought all the ideas were over and there's actually lots of new ideas. When I when I hang out with like someone like Sizzy or someone like Ace Aura or someone like, uh, like Onumi or people like that, I just go like this is like nuclear energy. Mm. These, these people are so full of this like magic that kind of wanes as people kind of wear you down. Right. But until they get their hands on you, it's like, it's like a nuclear reactor. Mm. Yeah. Shout out that to gives all me of energy. Them. Those are, those oh, are yeah. good names. Uh, what is the hardest you've worked? The hardest I've worked, crisis vision was the hardest I've worked. I've never worked that hard in my life. What about that it was, was harder? so much work. Like just trying to, because it was like that thematic thing. What about it made it harder? I felt like with that record, I was absolutely trying to just like restate my whole existence and be like, this is who I am now. Yeah. And it felt way more important than anything I had done before. And it felt like if I was going to do this, it was like my last try. Right. I was, I was like, if this doesn't do well, then I'm done. Yeah, that'll make you work hard. <laughs> I worked really hard, yeah. <laughs> uh, what makes work fun? Work is fun when it's funny. Great answer. Which I think a lot of things are funny. But work is fun when it's funny. When it feels serious, it's not fun. That's the perfect answer. Uh, what holds you back? Pressure. When I feel pressured, I shut down. Mm. Internal or external? External. I don't have a lot of internal pressure. I, I firmly believe I'll just float around and do what I'm supposed to do. If I'm being pushed in two different directions, I will remain stationary. That is how force works. <laughs> yeah. I love that. That's another good answer. What makes you tired? What makes me tired is writing. Writing makes me exhausted. I tend to write really, really, really fast. And I will exude like an ex, just like a massive amount of brain energy and then just crash. It's like a sprint. It's like a sprint. I don't ever like trot when I'm writing. I sprint. <laughs> I'll, I'll take like a three hour flight, write a whole song. It's like mixed and mastered. And then I get to the place where I'm going and I'm like, I need to sit down and stare at a wall until my show. Side note, I would love to see you trot sometime. I don't know if I'm a trotting type. <laughs> That's not true. I gallop. I feel like I trot. Ooh. I saunter. What, what about a nice canter? It's a canter, yeah, not a saunter. I saunter as well. I was going to say, I, yeah, you could saunter. I saunter, but I do canter. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I do all the... I feel like I'm a very... Um, I can make very equestrian steps. You're, you're a show pony is what I'm trying to say. You know, people put a lot of money into me. <laughs> going to take you out to the glue factory one of these days. The good pedigree, baby. <laughs> That's uh, how I got this mane. How do you unplug? How do I unplug? Um... Books are how I unplug. I also love film, especially animation. Any animated film, not like fucking minions, but like uh, like last night I watched Perfect Blue with my friend Brandon, and which I had never seen. I have, and seen I was it all about it. It's the I think it's the dude who did Paprika. Okay, yeah, I've I've heard of it. It's it's a bit older, right? Yeah, ninety seven. Was it good? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Terrifying though. Uh, Fun fact about it real quick. Please. The person who did the soundtrack, uh, I loved the soundtrack and I was like, this must be the same person who did Ghost in the Shell. But then I looked and they had never done another project except for like one shonen anime Oh, prior. So there you go. Okay. I like that. Sometimes it's fun too when someone will just come in and drop a banger and then disappear. Yep. I kind of respect that, you know? I respect it too. Uh, Looking at you, uh, fucking uh, DJ Encore, even though I know who actually wrote it. Wait, DJ Encore? DJ Encore had a I See Right Through to You. 
big trance hit in the early 2000s. Oh, oh shit. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm visualizing it now. But DJ Encore uh, had outsourced that song. Well, you know, sometimes that It's okay. Happens. They're doing good. They're doing really good. <laughs> sometimes I that promise. happens. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, okay. Just a couple more. Uh, what do you need? What do I need? Time. It's the one thing I can't have. That's right. Yeah, it's the one thing. But I do need it. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, uh, this is like almost a cliche to talk about at this point, but it's the most valuable thing in any of our lives, right? It's the one non-renewable resource. It is. I need time in order to do the things that I want to do. Well, you can't have it. Nope. <laughs> nope. Um, okay. Two more. No, that's a stupid one. One more. Uh, what do you? No, ask me the stupid one. Okay, it's just what gets you down. What gets me down? The man. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> what gets me down is um, apathy. Good answer. Apathy gets me down. A lot of that flying around these days. Sure is, but it's. I'm not coming from a place of holier than thou. I think apathy gets us all down. I think apathy is something that's easy to fall into. It's easy to give up and it's easy to become crestfallen and it's easy to decide that things aren't worth fighting for. Yeah. And it's also easy to just, and that's, that's not on a macro level or on a, on a, on a major scale. It's like a down to the smallest things in your life. Like it's always worth giving a shit. Amen, man. And you're right. Yeah. It's, it's definitely not coming from a judgy point because we've all been there. Yeah. But, uh, more and more, seeing it more and more, at least. Yes, so. it, can, it, it can. Apathy is contagious. Amen. Uh, okay, this is the last one. Uh, All right. It is, uh, what do you want to leave behind? A real big mess for someone else to clean up. <laughs> yes. Yeah, there it That's is. That's not even a joke. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want... <laughs> I imagine you, when you die, you just explode. I hope so. <laughs> I hope that when I go... Somebody is pissed about it. I hope when I go, somebody is just really fucking upset that I've put them through that. Well, I mean, the janitor who's got to clean it up is definitely going to yeah. be mad. Or, or not even a janitor, maybe like, I don't know. I When I go, I want to, I'll get mine. <laughs> <laughs> That's, yeah, it sounds, that sounds threatening. That did sound very threatening, yeah. <laughs> well, I guess it is a threat. It's just not a violent threat. Right. Well, shit, man, this, this is fun. Uh, I don't know that I have too much more. Is there anything else uh, that you wanted to talk about? Anything else as far as like must die goes that we should get out there? I don't know, man. I'm kind of just like doing the thing right now. You're like I don't have a lot to say because I'm about to say it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously we'll come back another time and say more. Yeah. Oh, actually, let me ask you this too, as because we, I feel like we did a good job dispelling a couple myths uh, today. Oh yeah, so there's I, a lot of myths. There's a lot. I, I wanted to ask you. You put out the the remix album for Crisis Vision a while back. Yes, with an I amazing did. slate of people remixing your tunes. Can you talk about the process of putting that together? As far as like having to ask all of your friends for something, and then also having to kind of critique the thing they give you because it's coming out like under your name? I actually was very not involved. I, first of all, I never critique. Okay. Never. Like if someone sends me something, um, I don't do that. But what if, what if you ask somebody to remix your, a tune for you and they send you back a remix that you just don't vibe with? You're just not feeling? I wouldn't ask someone that would do that. Okay. That's the answer. All right. Uh, because I trust the taste. So for, for me, how that process went is I had a spreadsheet with Schism, Tommy, um, and he and I uh, went back and forth and we we're like, I'd like to see this. I'd like to see this. I'd like to see this. And he'd go, we can't do this. We can do this. We can't do this. We can do this. This person said this. He would do all that for me. Right. So I would just go, okay. And I made a couple of adjustments and then we had everyone we wanted. Like we really wanted, I remember we really wanted Darren Styles. Oh, man. That was the one I really wanted. That would be sick. I, I remember I wanted... Um, I wanted Darren Styles. I wanted... Um, I think I wanted to reach out to like N Vitro. Oh, yeah. And like a few of the hardcore dudes even then. Right. And and we couldn't. I think the timing was just so weird and the deadlines were so fast. We ended up just having everyone we had and I was like, perfect. Like This works out. But 
Yeah, I think with remix albums, I always tend to be really hands off because I really don't like critiquing people. Which is a good stance to have. In yeah. General. I don't know. I don't, I don't like when people critique me. I don't think I've ever listened to any advice. So like, which is good. I mean, but that's the thing, man. That's, I hope uh, like producers listening hear that too, because there's so much, I, I like, I, you know, if, if there's something you're wondering about asking for feedback, that's one thing. But when you kind of yeah. just send a tune to somebody and they send back a bunch of thoughts and feelings you didn't ask for that kind of thing, it's easy to get in your own head about it, but yeah, you should not listen to that. Yeah, I never do. <laughs> I highly recommend people stop talking. <laughs> that's, that's great advice. That's, <laughs> that's, for, for what we're doing right now in this podcast, that's great advice. Yeah. <laughs> I, I know, I'm just saying, like, I, I highly recommend people make their creative process a little more like, it's yours, man. Amen. I don't know. Should we stop talking? Should we take your advice? Yeah, let's just disappear into the void. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, until the next time uh, I see you floating around. Yeah. Uh, it's it's Go cool. to hell, man. <laughs> yeah, fuck you, buddy. <laughs> yeah, fuck you, bud. <laughs> 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 Thank you okay. so much for having uh, me. <laughs> dude, anytime. You, I, you know I love you, man. I hope to see you soon. I love soon. you too, dude. <laughs> All right, dude. I'll talk to you soon. <laughs> bye. All right, bye.